Welcome to the Workology podcast, where we discuss the science and art of the workplace, gain powerful insights, resources, and perspectives on the industries of human resources and recruiting. Join your host, Jessica Miller Merrill, chief blogger of bloggingforjobs.com, for a 45 minute in depth and no holes barred look into the future of our most powerful business asset, the employee. And now, here's your host, Jessica, with this episode of Workology. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Workology podcast. It's great to have you on uh, this podcast joining us as part of Blogging for Jobs and the Recruiter's Lounge blog family. My name's Jessica Miller Merrill, and I'm the chief blogger and founder of Blogging for Jobs. Uh, This is the Workology podcast where we talk about the intersection between the workforce, human resources, and recruitment. Today's guest is my friend, Jim Knight. Jim is one of the most dynamic speakers and personalities out there. Uh, I guess as dynamic as his hair, I suppose. (laughs) Um, I I first met Jim, it was probably four or five years ago, and we were at the People Report Summer Camp, and uh, we were singing in a bathroom. Um, We called it the Flush Mob. That's right. So uh, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Jim. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that that brings back memories. We've uh, we've had a lot of fun with the old flush mob dons performing in a women's restroom near you, right? Available on YouTube. So right. <laughs> uh, so so tell us, tell the audience a little bit about you, what you do, and and you know really who Jim Knight is. Yeah. Um, well, well, thank you so much for involving me too. I'm I'm honored and uh, and thrilled. And yeah, like you said, we've known each other for a couple of years. And you know, I was always looking for a great opportunity to do some work with you. So thank you so much for having me on. Who is Jim Knight? Uh, I don't know. The current Jim Knight aspires to really be a thought starter for businesses and help them be more effective and sustainable. But you know, my background was really in hospitality. And, and I know because when we met each other at Summer Brain Camp, a lot of the people that were there, I initially thought that conference was a training and HR conference. But, yeah, it had uh, operators and marketing and uh, a lot of great individuals that, that uh, I probably wouldn't have had an opportunity to meet if I hadn't just sort of stepped out of my, my regular wheelhouse. But, you know, my background really as a kid was playing with uh, action figures and watching Star Trek and <laughs> reading comic books. So. You know, it was uh, like a lot of the kids my age, but eventually it turned to music. So I guess that's, you know, relative to your question. That's really where things started for me in high school. Kind of like the um, the uh, TV show Glee. That was really my life. I was interested in, in performing. And to this day, I'm still massively attracted to people who can sing and dance and act and now, of course, speak. And I wanted to be that person. I wanted to do something like that. And I did get a uh, scholarship and ultimately my, uh, my Associate of Arts degree in music performance and education. Although my voice was uh, classically trained, so Jessica, it's not like singing in the bathroom now where I get to hang out with some of our rock star friends. Uh, my voice was really choral and uh, a little bit formal and opera, if you will, a lot of church music. Uh, to this day, I can still do a wedding or a funeral if needed. Um, And so I uh, discovered at college, even though I had a scholarship, that to really be successful and to make a lot of money, you had to be great. Uh, So I changed direction in life because I wasn't great. I was okay. Um, They they say that those that can't do teach. So I focused on a history degree at the university level. I became a substitute middle middle school teacher. Um, Did that for six years. And I actually thought that education was going to become my future. But as you know... If you are teaching, we're not making any money in the summer. And uh, so June, July, and August, I needed to find something else. I found a second job, and I applied as a host at a new Hard Rock Cafe that had opened up in Orlando. That's where I'm from is is Central Florida. And, uh, yeah, I absolutely fell in love with with, uh, the culture, specifically the people, I think. It was just the most interesting collection of humans that I'd ever seen on the planet. And it was perfect because I got a chance to use that combination of the music stuff that I wasn't doing anymore and a little bit of the education background. Ultimately, I was a a trainer and a manager there. And, you know, I got a chance to look the way I wanted. I wanted to be in a music-oriented environment. It's a chance to to meet a lot of people, meet girls, and uh, travel the world all while getting paid. It was like the best job ever. And, and, of course, I started liking my night job a lot better than my day job. So I just wound up staying with uh, with Hard Rock International for 21 years, if you can believe that. 
So starting off as a line level employee, but eventually running that part of the uh, the global brand, and it was global. I was doing a lot of travel. I think I maybe made my way to forty something countries. But I, anyway, the the long answer to your question really is that my responsibilities as a professional now were really all because of the experience of developing my training skills. And that was pretty much anything you could think of, print, video, uh, e-learning, instructor-led stuff, uh, opening properties, of course. Um, and it ran the gambit, management, staff level, whatever it was. And that, that went all the way until I retired from corporate life. You can't see me, but I've got the quotation bunny years ago. And I retired from corporate life uh, a couple years ago to do my own thing and, and help out some other companies and actually other industries. So, so long answer to your question, but uh, I don't know there's a little bit of a flavor of me in there. I think it's a good story. I mean, um, I, it's nice to understand the history of, of, of where somebody came from to, to where they are now. And, and I think it's certainly like served you well and also gave you some really great context for all the work, work that you're, you're doing right now. Um, today's topic is creating a company and team where culture rocks. So that's what Jim's going to be talking about with me over the course of probably the next 40 minutes or so. Um, and it's allowed Jim to, to speak all over the world and, and travel all over the world and work all over the world. So um, Jim, tell us, uh, why do you think culture at work is important? Ah, geez, man, that's the that's the ultimate question, right? Um, well, well, to me, of course, culture is everything, uh, but you can't you can't really say that to an executive or a leader if that's all you're going to do is just make it sort of fluffy. You can't throw down the culture card, and, and certainly, I've learned over the years, and it, some of it's been painful learnings, but uh, I, I know now that I've got to have something tangible. Uh, metric driven behind it if we're going to say that culture really is everything what does that mean and and i guess probably the first thing that i wanted to do was actually define culture you know it's one of those nebulous esoteric kind of concepts for some leaders which is by the way probably why it's been i would guess dismissed or not specifically addressed in the past but you can tell it's changing right it's a pretty big buzzword in corporate america these days and actually now defining culture is one of the main objectives when I speak and actually in the book. So I spent a lot of time on that. I, I really just wanted to give it a, a crystal clear definition of it so that it was in fact tangible and, and malleable. You could see it when it was happening. You, you'd know when it wasn't happening and you could address it. And, and I, maybe to your question, I think, um, you know, it's important because I think you can see it and feel it a mile away. You, you know, I, I've been in businesses before that are, barely out of what I call the honeymoon period, you know, whatever it is, whatever you're selling, your product, your service, whatever it is, let's say you're not even open a year, but yet you can tell it, it's, uh, it's flat, it's dead as a doornail. And, you know, leadership gets blamed for that. You know, they're the ones who make that happen or don't make it happen, perhaps in that case. But I've been in businesses as you have 10, 15, 20 years old, and the buzz is still there. The positive vibe is, is completely apparent. You know, especially when you watch the employees, they, they clearly are engaged. They, uh, they can't move fast enough for the customer, even when it's slow. And, and, and let's say nobody else is around. It's one of my all time favorite things to do is sit in the middle of a business when it is, in fact, slow, like on a Monday afternoon and, and just watch the employees and see if they've got that uh, uh, fire in their belly, their attention to detail. They've got a sense of urgency that they're positive, they're jovial, they're actually high-fiving other employees, that's when you know it's pretty spectacular and there's a great culture there. It's, it might be underneath the, uh, the, the level, the skin for some people, but I think most people know and they can feel it whether it's happening or not. I think it's the, the, the feeling of culture as a customer when you're walking in through the door uh, or at, you're at a place of business is pretty apparent in a lot of the, like the retail or hospitality or like customer first um, sort of focused environments, um, yep. at, which is which is interesting because you can walk into like a call center or uh, a lawyer, a, you know, a, a law firm office. Um, it's not oftentimes that you feel the same way when you when you walk into, uh, you know, a, a really great restaurant that that has just this, you know, electricity to it. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, you're right. There's something about hospitality in general, restaurants, retail, hotels. You know, you probably are hiring people that are pretty 
you know, external, that they probably got killer personalities, you know, and, and to be fair, also, I worked in an environment where rock and roll was the palette with which I got to paint. So you, you definitely have some pretty odd misfits, you know, when it comes to that industry versus some of the industries that you talked about, banking, insurance, law firms, call centers, but you can still feel it. And, and some of the examples of some of the brands I might talk about in a session or even in the book are in fact outside of hospitality because you, you also want to single those companies out and say, see, it can be done regardless of the industry. You can create an unbelievable, powerful culture that rocks, if you will. So what kind of workplaces or, or what does a workplace look like that has a culture that rocks? Well, I, I probably would start with um, some of the points that I was mentioning earlier. I mean, for me, for all intents and purposes, the culture exists because of the employees. So I would look for that engagement. I would look for their sense of urgency and attention to detail and responsiveness and genuine care. And, you know, are you client, customer, consumer, guest obsessed? Because that, to me, that screams right out of the workplace environment. Um, you know, and, and all of that just leads to the customers wanting to come back. You know, the, and the, really, those are the metrics I care about. Is the guest going to come back? Are they going to spend more money? And are they going to tell other people about the experience? And if, in, in my mind, I, I talk about this analogy when I've got time in a work, when, you know, it's, a, it's an actual workshop and not, let's say, an hour keynote because you're limited on time. But if I can get to people and talk about the fact that the majority of our waking lives is at work, you know, and, and we all know that. And so when the work environment is spectacular, when it's a strong culture, you as an employee, you want to stick around longer. You become invested. You, you become, I think, more passionate about the business. And, and I'm an absolute believer that there's a direct correlation with reducing turnover, which is the root of all evil, I think, in, in almost any industry, but it definitely is in hospitality. You know, you never get to, to to the sweet stuff. You never get to the cool stuff because there's a correlation between turnover and the profitable health of the business. So if all you're ever doing is training and developing new people and you're the hamster on the wheel, you really do never get to the encore. And so, I, again, this is maybe a, a much longer way to answer your question. I think the, the workplace looks like when people are engaged, when things are happening, when the lighting and the music and the the buzz and, and in some places the sex appeal is so wonderful that the customers just go, oh yeah, I want more of that. I'm coming back. I'm spending more money and I'm telling other people about it. And that's probably the old, uh, you know, service profit chain. You take care of your employees and, uh, you know, that, that ultimately is going to lead to the, them taking care of the customers and, and they're going to want more. Having spent um, quite a bit of time in uh, the San Francisco Bay area and Silicon Valley, uh, a lot of these hot tech startups, they are, are really working towards creating this really amazing culture because the data engineers and the scientists and, and all these Ruby on rail engineers, they're highly sought after there. Yeah. And so anything that you can do to create uh, an amazing culture from having a uh, kegs on Fridays in, in the workplace, brec to, you know, breakfast brought in, uh, ping pong tables. I mean, you name it, it's been done. So uh, environments, not just hospitality, but um, those really highly competitive industries and in environments, uh, I really think I understand that having the right people in the right place does really make a difference for your company. It does. It totally does. And I wouldn't discount all those things that you mentioned, whether it's ping pong tables and music in the background and brown bag lunches and bring your dog to work. You know, those things are all great. But I really do think if at the core, if the culture is weak, if the leadership is is not in the right place from a value orientation, man, those things are just initiatives. You're just you're throwing a lot of money and a lot of effort at things that aren't going to be true sustainable for the business. So would I love to have all that stuff? And I, in fact, of course, have worked at, at a company like that. I, I totally dig that. But at the end of the day, if all you did was just walk around and say, thank you, and I appreciate you, and you rock, and here's what I'm going to do for you, and it's it's great solid pay and great benefits, and people care about me and look me in the eye and care about my growth, for, get, get out of the way. You don't need all those other things. Now, if you can have both, I, I'll, I, I'll take that any day of the week. But you're absolutely right. I think it is about the employees, not all those innovative, you know, you think they're innovative initiatives that really the cool companies are just doing as an, it's almost a byproduct. They're doing that because people are sticking around a little bit longer. 
Yeah, well, the difference between, you know, having an engineer or a team of engineers leave your uh, your startup or your technology company can be detrimental. I mean, billions or millions of dollars. So it makes sense to uh, to start from, from the, the top down and then bring in these other, you know, important uh, components to, to making a great workplace and a great culture. Totally agree. Totally uh, one of the things uh, that I was thinking about as I was putting like kind of this podcast together and imp- the idea of employee, employee engagement is a really hot topic. Any po- time I talk about employee engagement on the blog or uh, when I'm speaking, it, everybody um, perks up. I mean, I'm assuming that the culture that rocks, there's a really imp- like employee engagement is an important component of that. But a- a like any human being, I like when I'm in the workplace, I my empl- my engagement is kind of fluid, like it ebbs and flows. There's sometimes that I'm just really engaged and excited and loving what I'm doing. And then other times it's kind of like, man, I really wish that I was somewhere else. What do you suggest for a company to kind of be able to maintain um, and get the best out of their employees over over the long term and, and keep them excited and, and fluid? Yeah, and I think your your point is really valid. I mean, of course, everybody's going to go through different things throughout the uh, throughout their work life. And, uh, you know, I guess in general, I'm not sure that I ever thought I know this is going to sound so silly and probably stereotypical, um, you know, for me working in a brand like Hard Rock, there wasn't a single day in two decades that I was driving up to work going, ah, I wish I didn't have to come in today. I always had stuff that was going on, but I looked forward to actually being there. And a lot of it had to deal with the other people that I got to hang out with. So part of my personal employee engagement was feeding off of other people that wanted to be there. I, you know, the, the, were there disengaged employees? Yeah, I'm sure. I, I don't know what the percentages are of what today's workforce is, but for me, I just didn't see it very often at uh, at this business. And again, I, I don't want to just talk about Hard Rock. I do have a love affair with them. I'll forever have a business crush on that brand. But the reality is I think that can happen anywhere. And it is a, you know, again, I'm going to hang my hat on the leadership. I think that that the managers, he or she, whoever the top boss is, they can control that. Without a doubt, the answer for me is always going to be yes that you can keep your employees interested in work at your company at all times, especially the internal culture. And, and for me, it is the reason why I stayed with a singular company for as long as I did. And when I'm facilitating at an in-person event, I love to use a lot of analogies. And one of my favorites is to use an iceberg. I call it the iceberg effect. I'm sure everybody has, has thought about this before. But the reality of a brand, to me, looks like an iceberg. That the top part, you know, I think everybody on your podcast would know, you only see like 10, 15 percent of, of what the iceberg is, like the bulk of the thing, the mass of is below the surface. So if the consumer sees or if they experience this unbelievably great work environment, that isn't the, that isn't the stuff up top in my mind. That's all happening below the surface. The bottom part, that 80, 85 percent, that's the employee environment, your mission statement. Your value orientation, every policy, every procedure, the service, philosophy, whatever it's going to be, your leadership environment, like all things in my mind are created twice, first mentally and then physically. And if we think about these things and put all these things in place, including the way that we're going to develop that internal employee environment, then you hope like heck that it parlays right up to the top where the the outside world, the public sees it. So I'm a huge believer, again, in that sort of service profit chain that I talked about before. I think if you really develop this this employee engagement, and and it isn't just money, it isn't just benefits, it's a lot of the other things that I mentioned before, I have to believe that they want to be around and and you, as a leader, make the environment so spectacular, they can't even imagine their life elsewhere. I've seen companies that do it. I've been lucky enough to work for companies that have done that before. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of patience and, and sometimes a lot of pain, but it can be done, I think, in almost any industry, but it's going to have to start at the top. How do you think that um, managers, you know, maybe somebody like you as a general manager of a facility or a restaurant or, or wherever, how can HR partner with somebody like you to help you, you know, help you have the skills or the tools or the resources to be able to, to have a great culture at your workplace? Yeah, um, if I understand your question, you're saying if I'm if I'm a general manager, how could I utilize 
human resource to help me keep the culture alive? Yeah. Are, are you looking at it from an HR standpoint? Yeah, because sometimes, you know, HR is kind of a little siloed, unfortunately. Or, or, you know, I felt like in being in human resource, a lot of times I only heard about the bad things. And <laughs> right. it, it was always like, here's this investigation that you need to happen or we need to fire Jimmy. You know, this is, you know, came to a head. But so I didn't get to hear the middle parts. And I wondered how um, HR can provide support to to those managers better to, to make for a great culture. Yeah, I, you know, this is, it's funny. I've always thought of HR in sort of two different camps and, and not to, not to again put everybody in a box, but this is just how I sort of have seen it the way that they've been positioned. You've either got the HR team that is very rules oriented and very strict, and then you've got the ones that might be the soft and fuzzy and, you know, maybe they don't carry as much of a weight uh, in the organization. And I think you've got to have a little bit of the, both. Um, and, and that's just sort of a, a platform, I would say, to get to answering your question. I do think that human resources can play a critical role in a lot of ways, particularly with a general manager, whether it's somebody who's been around for a while or let's say it's a new general manager and they're going to take over an existing team. And so one of the things that, that I, I think we've become very, very good at is trying to partner up HR with that that leader, whoever that leader is. So I'm a huge fan. Let's say if they're a new person coming on board, I love to facilitate new leader transition classes. And you do that for the new leaders direct reports. So right out of the gate, and we, we didn't create this at Hard Rock, the, you know, the U S army did this Walt Disney world's done this. What you're trying to do is eliminate the, the loss in productivity and people trying to figure out the new leader and all that stuff. You get over that very, very quickly when you're able to, in a very non-threatening third party instructor way to get people to understand how the leader is going to operate. And then you're off to the races. So that would be maybe if it was a new person, but I would think, you know, being, being a voice to, uh, to whisper inside the leader's ear, you know, providing a synopsis perhaps of some key employees that they may or may not know, or maybe the general manager does know, and, and they're trying to get past whatever some of these uh, hardened employees that have been around for a while, perhaps they're not getting it or they need a little bit of some, some uh, passion building. They need some fire in their belly a little bit. Might be that the HR person can help them perform, uh, you know, an employee survey, you know, written with some very specific business questions, perhaps even around the leader or the existing business. In, in my role, I was a training and development guy, honestly, but I've always reported up through human resources I've always offered to co-facilitate some strategic initiatives together with the, the middle manager, the general manager, a director, um, multi-unit director, whatever it is, so that you can continue to have a, a sort of a people-oriented lifeline to HR. So you're not really an island out there on your own. And, and you know, just you, you want to be the sounding board for the organization. And, and I think sometimes HR can be an internal cultural voice for the managers or for the leaders or whoever it is. And I've often said that HR executives really are considered the conscience of the company and they can be the voice of the people. So I think they've got a huge role in really helping shape the organizational culture, whether it's at the top or what I think your question is, which is sort of in the middle, the, the general managers that really might be just sort of a, a CEO of their own company in an island out on their own. Sometimes I think that HR gets a, a bad rap and, and I always kind of make a little joke when I, when I do presentations because when I have told people in my career or people ask you, what, what do you do for a living? And you tell them that you work in the HR, inevitably their, their question to me is, tell me about the last time you fired someone. Yeah. Because people really only think of HR oftentimes for hiring and, and firing. And, and there's so much more to, to what a really good strategic HR uh, person actually does in their job. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. And, and, you know, and that is the tough stuff. Nobody likes firing people unless, you know, you're a complete mascus out there. It's the worst thing that you have to do. And so, of course, that has some emotional baggage with it. And you remember it and people remember if that's happened to people around them or themselves. So, of course, they're going to talk about that. But, you know, I, I would go back to my earlier thought that I think that you can join at the hip of almost all the executives, but in particular, whoever the top person is, to be a partner, whisper in their ear, be a lifeline to them. Um, I, I really do think that they can help create the, the culture, or at least sustain the culture of the organization. And, you know, you're not out there on your own. That, that's exactly what uh, human resources is all about. They're the people oriented side of the business. 
Well, let's take a little bit of reset for here for a second. I want to welcome you to the Workology podcast. This is Jessica Miller Merrill, and I am talking with Jim Knight. And Jim, you have a new book that's coming out called Culture That Rocks. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book? And, and I mean, I, I feel like it's about culture, so we've kind of been covering that, but uh, what, what's it all about? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is about culture. I, I tried to make sure. I think I've got that word on the uh, cover twice. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. It is my first book. It's definitely a how-to business book on how to create or adjust, or even in some companies, just how do you maintain your organizational culture. I think the the subtitle that we've decided to go with is how do you revolutionize your company's culture? Because I do think that a lot of times for when I get hired to actually do a speech, it's a little bit different than the book. You can't get obviously as in depth, but I get hired more for the culture topic than I do anything else that I do around engagement or service or philanthropy or leadership or whatever. Culture, as I mentioned at the top of the podcast, it's a big buzzword right now. And so I really know that there are a lot of people that are going, geez, I want to get back to the good old days or what it was like 20 years ago or whatever it is. So revolutionize seemed to be the right word for me. Um, you know, and again, certainly the luxury of working for one of the greatest brain cultures in the world, in my mind, like hard rockets influence me. So I have some experience in what that looks and feels like, but I guess at the same time, over the last two decades, I've I've really been able to network. Uh, I, I've studied other brands, some of whom you know really struggled, and others who do it well. And uh, that's also helped kind of craft the ideas and recommendations that that I uh, suggest in the book. But the book, it definitely has a music orientation to it. You know, if you know me, it, you know it, it's going to have uh, some band and brand analogies. I make a lot of those throughout the uh, the entire book, but but not in a I'm not trying to, to make it too cutesy. I, I really have it as organizational points so that it has something specific and, and meaty for people to take away. No doubt it's going to have some uh, hard rock current and eddies throughout the whole thing. Um, but but I make a lot of references and quotes to some of my rock and roll heroes. I use those as uh, learnings really for the reader. Um, yeah, so so I've learned over the years. I, I, re- I knew that it was always going to have a, a music background and orientation to it. But really, I just wanted it as a platform. There's a fine line between trying to be cool and and being too themey. And I'm not even going to claim that I attained the coolness in the book, but I definitely wanted to deliver, like I said, meaty, tangible content in a fun music environment, all all the while being authentic. So hopefully hopefully uh, we've attained that. It'll be my first book. So I'd be really interested to hearing what people think. I think that you just described you because I mean, (laughs) really, I mean, you're, you're entertaining, very music oriented, uh, but you're also really honest, but just, just a, you know, fun, straight up guy. Like you, I don't want to say you ooze, but like, it just surrounds you. Like there's just this (laughs) vibe about you that just draws people in. And I think that that's really important in the workplace. You want to have a culture or just a vibe that says, man, I got to get in there. I got to get an interview. Well, I, I appreciate that. I mean, there certainly is probably now some some branding that's happened over the last two, three decades with me, part of it with Hard Rock, part of it just because of the, the, the way I am. And, you know, I decided to write the book in first person. So there, there's a little bit, I guess, of climbing underneath the hood, um, which, you know, freaks me out a little bit. But you know, to hear you say that, I really do appreciate it, you know, but, but maybe the second part of that is you don't want to be so, I guess, over the top. And it's so music oriented that the message gets lost. Like I said, this book, it is going to help, I think, business managers or leaders amp up their brand. The overall product uh, in my mind feels like one of my sessions. I want it to be chock-a-block, just full of ideas to strengthen the culture you know, some of them are, are proven best practices and, and uh, killer brands that you probably are the same ones that you and I would probably think about. And some of them are going to be some crazy ideas, you know, a little bit of irreverence and out of the box suggestions. And I love being that guy, too. I love sort of, you know, shaking the stick. There are 18 chapters in the book. So, you know, there's a lot of meat in there, I would say. And, and hopefully I think people that are going to come to the table with different needs and expectations, you know, depending on the business they're in or, you know, whatever current state their company culture is. I, I just wanted to hit on on many areas of the brand. Some of it you already mentioned. It's it's employee engagement. It's uh, I touch on customer service. I talk about creating differentiation, another buzzword these days, right? 
Um, I talk about recruiting and hiring and, and getting the right fit. I talk about the employee life cycle. Um, you know, th there's some jaunts in there around philanthropy. I, I, I do take a little bit of a heavier stick when I talk about uh, leadership and the crucial need for top executives to get it and how they can make a huge impact on, on the business from a cultural standpoint. So, you know, I've, I've, I've got a lot of stuff in there. I use the old analogy. It's 10 pounds of content, in a five pound bag. So hopefully there's enough for different people, depending on how they come to the party. Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about being a manager of a team because a lot of our readers of, of blogging for jobs and in, in the recruiters lounge and, and hopefully this podcast, some of them are uh, mid-level to senior level HR managers um, and other leaders within the organization. But what advice do you have for, for maybe those folks? So maybe they don't have the control or the say or the ability um, to maybe influence the entire organization and, and create this this very large overarching uh, organizational culture. Uh, what advice do you have for them if they were in maybe a smaller, you know, team oriented or middle manager position where they can't influence the overall, but they still wanted to create a culture uh, for their team? Great question. And probably my most asked question when I'm doing a workshop, honestly especially when the audience is in fact middle managers. I get it all the time. They, they sometimes don't ask in the, in the general Q and a, they might pull me aside, but that's their biggest fear is, Hey, I'm just a middle manager. How can I go out there and, and make the culture exactly like what you're talking about or how I envision in my company. And, and I tell them, I, I think that leaders at any level, I, I really do. And, and I would consider them to be a leader they have the power to light up or extinguish the cultural flame of a company. They control their own destiny. And many times they're the, they are the leadership. Like, like they, they represent the company culture as much as anybody else, particularly for the line level staff. Like if, if I'm a, whatever the, the lowest line level is in any company, when I show up to work, whoever my manager is, that's the brand, that's the culture that day. So uh, they, they might not think in those terms. They might think, oh, I can't do anything because the company is this way or we've been told to do it a, a, a certain way or whatever. But at the end of the day, they're the ones who are going to make the, the environment at the very least something that will be harmonious and where people want to come back and work, at least be around them. You know, and I was, I was once a uh, licensed facilitator for Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, still like one of the, the best uh, – personal development conferences out there. And, you know, the, the, the book is pretty heady, um, but when you go through the actual course itself, it actually, you'll learn a lot about yourself. But anyway, well, one of the concepts that always resonated with me was this idea of what you were alluding to, you know, how, how do you, how do you increase your span of control when it comes to the culture of the company? And so there was a concept that we learned and I've used it forever. And it's the circle of influence, the circle of control. You've probably seen these two, uh, kind of areas. It really, it's a, it's a circle of concern. I think they said it. And, and the whole goal was to stay at all times in that circle of influence. You know, there's a lot of things that you care about, but you can't do anything about, you know, world peace and the weather and, and whether this company gets bought out by another company, even if it's mine or the rumor mill, whatever. Th those are in your, your, your circle of concern. You care about it, but you can't do anything about it. But the stuff that I can how I want to spend my money, my attitude, how I want to treat other people, all of that stuff, totally in your, your sphere of influence. So one of the things that I would always do with my team, if there was ever any questions out there about, oh, we can't control this, or, oh, it looks like, you know, they might be downsizing, whatever it is, Ali Ali in free, I would call everybody in, we'd all get together, my team, and I'd say, listen, you're going to hear stuff out there. You've got to stay within the things that we can absolutely control. And then what happens this is a long answer to your question. But what happens is your circle of influence starts to grow. If you just keep crushing it at the things that you're doing and you, you disregard everything else that's going on around you, no matter how negative or bad or whatever the perception is, you can't help but people go, they've got some nice wins. They've got a couple W's underneath their belt and they stayed positive and they were, they were focused on getting results. And all of a sudden, somebody's going to give you more influence. They give you more responsibilities. And, and I do remember clearly when I was a manager with no leadership direction, I had a general manager at one time who wasn't that great. And quite honestly, there were a lot of times I was running shifts in a restaurant, one of the busiest restaurants in the world, no boss around. I controlled the culture of the company. 
You know, I, I couldn't do drastic things that would resonate throughout the entire organization or, or the entire uh, brand, if you will. But for all intents and purposes, those four walls, that shift, that that was me creating that culture. And so, you know, sometimes I had to psych myself up to say I can make a difference. But for the culture to continue to strengthen or ever get back to the good old days, we need middle managers. That We need people to to speak out and be brave enough to focus on the culture and stay positive during changes. And yeah, even once in a while, challenge the status quo and bring new ideas to the table. But if I could ever give somebody one great solid piece of advice, it's stay within your circle of influence. And in my mind, the culture, that shift, that day with those employees, you control that. And and when that happens, wonderful things are going to happen. I really do believe a revolution can be started with a single person with a great idea. We need people to, to start revolutions. I agree with you, and I absolutely agree that one person can make a difference, and they just have to have focus and keep that circle of influence along with them. And and when you have a support of a community of people, whether it's at your store or your restaurant or your team, you can accomplish anything or your family. I mean, whatever it is. Um, and that's really exciting. Like the every, it, like there's no limit. Exactly. And you know, when you get enough people around you like that, now all of a sudden, you know, it's not you slinging the blade out there fighting the battle on your own. You know, you've got an army of giants around you who also think like that. It's, you know, I'm all about diversity. I love people that are single-minded. I certainly, again, worked for a brand where there were some pretty interesting misfits there, but when it came to the ultimate mission and what we were trying to do, which is literally go out there and create unbelievable authentic experiences, then all of a sudden it, it, you stick out like a sore thumb. If you're somebody who doesn't have a voice, if you're somebody who doesn't have any passion, if you're somebody who doesn't even fit in from a, you know, and I'm not talking about fit in from a look and feel. I'm saying somebody who's a slacker, somebody who doesn't care. You know, th- those people get voted off the island these days a lot quicker than anybody else. So. You know, maybe you're the first one out there and, you know, that, that, that's how revolutions get started. But ultimately, you, you can make a huge amount of change. And uh, you're right. I think your wrap up to that was just stay within your circle of influence. You get to control the culture, and, you know, and, and that's really the story of my life. My career has always been I just did one thing and one thing well. You know, I'm mediocre at a lot of stuff. There's only one or two things that I thought I could do well, and I did that well. And somebody said, Hey, let's give that guy a little bit more responsibilities. And then all of a sudden your influence grows and then you got a little bit more. And next thing you know, you've got an awesome job, you know, running training for an entire brand in 55 countries. That doesn't happen by accident. That's pretty fun. I I will say that um, ask any manager or uh, employee that's worked in some sort of hospitality environment and they will tell you how one person can influence because they are good managers that people love working at at their store or restaurant and they impact everything. And then yep. there's others that um, are so toxic. And in my first HR gig in retail, what I ended up doing is I started pulling call-ins and looking at the weekends that certain people were working, uh, what management teams were working together. And it was amazing to me how glaringly obvious one person, one leader, completely uh, influence negatively or positively a, a location you know, with 30 employees in it. Yeah. And isn't it sad how many, pro- unfortunately, the really good employees who just won't put up with it, even, even in an environment like right now where there might be high unemployment, if they're a rock star, they don't need you. You know, the rock stars can always get another gig. They will go somewhere else if there's a toxic leader, like you said. And it's unfortunate because sometimes the leader above that person is too weak to have the uncomfortable conversation. And, and ultimately, how many people leave? How much damage do they do to the culture before you can go and arrest that and, and make the, the culture strong again? So I, I'm with you. And I think at this point, at least in hospitality, you can no longer muscle results. You cannot manage through fear and threats and, and punishment. That just doesn't work. It might still work in some other industries, but we seriously really will run you out, you know, if, if you're a if you're a, a leader who operates like that. I just kind of feel like life's too short uh, to be unhappy or, or to work in a in a place where, um, you know, 
it, it isn't a good fit for somebody. And, and a lot of times, and I've had this conversation with employees, sometimes if they're really unhappy and, and they're causing a toxic work environment, I'll sit down with them and say, look, let me help you be happy. Let me help you find another place to work because exactly. you don't you don't know how your negativity is influencing everyone around you. Yep, I'm I'm with you. I agree. So, uh, can you give us some examples of some companies that you feel like have a, a great culture that rocks? Yeah, um, you know, in my speeches, you'll probably hear you know the four to five big brands that everybody knows. You know, I, I kind of have to do that because of time constraints, and I've got to be, I guess, broad enough where everybody can relate. I could easily pick a couple companies close by me locally, but then you know you don't have a lot of um, you, it doesn't resonate perhaps with everybody. But I can go into much more detail and provide a lengthier list when I'm in the book. And what I talk about in Culture That Rocks is I use the analogy of strong cultures exuding life-sustaining oxygen to the body, you know, where there's weak company cultures that literally are like poisonous carbon monoxide. So I use that sort of juxtaposition there. I don't talk about any of the negative brands, but definitely the positive ones. I, I, I prop them up as much as I can. So I think the positive rock star brands that I mentioned tend to be the ones that we probably all talk about when we mention the word culture. It's uh, the usual ones, Apple, Starbucks, uh, Southwest, Disney, and Nike. Um, in my world, I love talking about Harley Davidson. Google pops out in my mind, Coca-Cola. Um, I almost always talk about Chick-fil-A, which is very controversial at times, but I love mentioning that in a, in a at least in a um, instructor-led session. Um, Zappos, for sure. I mean, Zappos, I don't know, was on anybody's radar screen from a culture standpoint five, six years ago. And now I think there's something like the third or fourth, you know, best culture out there. Uh, of course, I'm going to talk about hard rock. You know, so those are probably the, the usual ones. And then I, I guess there's some great ones that might not immediately come to everybody's mind. But I do talk about them when you start to look underneath the, uh, the hood of some of the cool stuff they're doing. Uh, Lego, fantastic culture. Pixar. I think does a wonderful job. Cinnabon with our good friend Cat Cole at the helm has, has been phenomenal the, the last two years. I talk about Ikea, In-N-Out Burger, the Container Store. They tend to come up now. In fact, I just uh, that was one of the last things I wrote in the book. I hadn't had uh, something in there as much in retail. And uh, yeah, they, they scream off the page now for me as being a really good culture. And I've spent more time in their environment just because I like those guys so much more. Um, you know, and then I'll do some... Um, like I said, some lesser known kind of culture brands, culture warriors, if you will. Uh, Rackspace, you you know for sure. Yep. A lot of people might not know them from an IT or, you know, I guess now they, they say they're more in the cloud cloud uh, hosting business. Um, Zingerman's up in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area. So, you know, a lot of people love them. They swear by this community of businesses that they've created. I think they've got like eight or nine businesses in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area and they refuse to go outside of that area but yet they're totally changing the culture of that particular city with with just the way they operate i love them um you know suzy squirrel um one of some of my good friends run a place in the upper florida keys called island bay resort great cultural organization you know i even talk about in the book a uh a central florida mega church um and of course some really good coffee houses out there so it really really kind of runs the gamut, Jessica. I mean, you, you, you would start with the Starbucks, the Apple Southwest, but then you want to get down to sort of prop up some of the other ones who maybe don't get as much love out there. They're, they're not obviously the big dogs, but if I could put a shining spotlight on them and, uh, you know, some up and coming businesses, I love doing that. But, but I think I maybe counted 40 or so different brand examples that I highlighted in the book and that doesn't even include some of the industries that I singled out as great cultures that rock, that aren't at all hospitality, automotive service repair. I talk about some healthcare systems. Um, I, I do an entire case study on funeral directors. So there, there's some pretty interesting uh, companies out there that are really swinging a heavy stick when it comes to culture. And they'd be a little bit different than what you might expect. And I think we can learn from the different industries and the different companies, uh, you know, not even those that are housed maybe in our in our backyard. We can we can take bits and pieces of what they're doing, which is why I think your book's going to be so wonderful. And we can try to apply it in our workplaces. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, let's uh, knock on wood, right? I'm not yeah. sure if I have any wood, but oh. I'll take it. I'll yeah, take the pods. There you go. <laughs> 
Jim, I want to thank you for taking the time today to talk on the Workology podcast. Where can people find out more about you, take a look at the book, put in their pre-order, their order, wherever, where should they be going? Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, you know, they can check it out. Probably the best start would be my website, which is nightspeaker.com. That's exactly how it sounds. My last name, K-N-I-G-H-T, speaker.com. Um, they can talk, contact me through that. Uh, they pretty much have every avenue in social media you could think of. You want to email me if you want to um, Facebook me, if you want to jump onto Twitter. Uh, I'm at at night speaker. All of that stuff is pretty simple. Um, you know, and, and also that site will eventually have a landing page for the book. Um, so you could probably get there through culture that rocks.com or again, just go to that nightspeaker.com and both of them will lead to the same place. There will be some pre-order stuff in there. And then the entire site has whatever you'd want video of me, bio, my speaking topics, client list, all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I've absolutely been thrilled to just spend a little bit of time. And like I said, I've been wanting to do this for a while with you and, and this is spectacular. Thank you so much for having me. No, I'm excited. I'm excited on the book. We've been talking about it for a while. So it, it, it's, I mean, it's always so hard, um, trying to put together a book and then, and once you get it done, now you got to, um, get out there and, and people have to read it and love it and, and, uh, keep talking about it. Yeah. It's time to hustle, right? Yeah. It's funny that you said it took a while too. I have decided that I was uh, going to self publish. I decided that a couple of years ago it literally has taken me about five or six years to write because I went a, a pretty unusual track. I decided not to write, like all my friends said, a little bit each night. Instead, I wrote every bit of it while I was on vacations. So I would take one or two weeks a year, which obviously extends it out. And I had to constantly keep updating it to make sure that it was relevant. But boy, has it been a, a long, long process. It's been a labor of love, but to see it to come to fruition I'm excited about it. And really, it's just an extension of the brand. You know, I, I love being around people and uh, want to continue that on. But thank you so much for, for talking about the, the book in general. It's um, I'm excited about it for sure. I don't know how many more books I have in me. This might be it. <laughs> I, I think you'll have more. I think you'll have more. Well, thanks. Thanks to Jim for, for joining us. This is the Workology podcast. This is Jessica Miller Merrill. On a Workology, we discuss the science and art of the workplace HR and recruitment. I will see you next time, guys. Thanks again. Production services for the Workology podcast provided by Total.